When we previewed our game of the week, Southern versus Alcorn, in no way did I expect Alcorn to win in such a dominant manner. Oh, yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything. HBCU Athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor and current contributing writer at USA Today's Saints Wire. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S and ends with an S. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. And I know that nowadays, every single new hire can feel like a potential high stakes wager for your small business. And that's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your job faster and for free. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions do apply. You would have thought it was a Friday episode the way we're going to keep with one game all the way throughout. But Southern versus Alcorn, which was our game of the week on Friday, where we did our three matchups, two storylines, one key to victory. It was so impactful, number one. And then number two, the way the victory for Alcorn happened, it couldn't be contained in two segments. Had to stress that thing on after three. So we're going to wrap up. Looking at our keys to victory, which we did have on Friday, but they were extremely influential, so I want to see how they played out. Prior to that, we'll look at the SWAC West. There's still four teams who could possibly win. I want to look at how they could win. But before any of that, let's get into this defense because the all-corn defense absolutely dominated Southern in a, a fashion that in no way did I see coming, right? And I know a lot of times when I come out here and I, I – puff my chest out and I, I say it with a whole lot of bravado when I'm speaking about defenses. A lot of times I don't feel like the offense played up to a standard and the defense carried that offense. But that's not the case this time. This has nothing. This is nothing about the offense's inefficiency. It's just that I personally felt like the defense was a star. To be clear, Alcorn scored 44 points. The defense has some help there, but the Alcorn offense was kicking let's not get that misconstrued because sometimes when i come in here and i highlight the defense is because the offense hasn't done this that and the third that offense did this that the third and the fourth and fifth they were good it's just that when i'm looking at this game and i'm looking at what southern wasn't able to do i got to give a lot of respect and a lot of credit to that all corn defense for their performance now we are going to do a good amount of looking back on Friday and looking at our matchups and looking at our keys. And hey, our second segment is kind of all about the, the storylines, to be honest. But it's not because, oh, we just need to review things. I thought that the matchup storylines and key to victory really ended up being influential or the outcome influenced the storylines themselves, right? But that all corn defense held Southern to 21 points. And while it might not seem like, oh, they didn't shut them down, they didn't hold them to seven, when you look at how they were able to do it, they were suffocated. They were dominated. This wasn't a 21-point performance. Go find your local Southern fan and ask them how they're feeling about their football team right now. And that will tell you just how bad this game was for the Jaguars. Like, I didn't, for the record, I didn't think it was a good performance. But the way that they are ready to get rid of Eric Dooley, mind you, let's rewind maybe a week, two weeks ago. We're speaking about the Bayou Classic like that might possibly decide who's going to be the Swag West champion. I've seen somebody on Twitter say the, the Bayou Classic isn't going to de decide the division. Instead, it's going to decide who fires their coach first. That's where we are today. That's where we are now. And that's because of the biggest matchup kind of 
advantage, I would say, coming into the game that Alcorn had. That's their secondary versus the Southern wide receivers. And really the pass game in, in kind of general, but we look at the wide receivers. The biggest trend in this matchup that I wanted to highlight was you have Harold Blood, who has thrown an interception in all but two games. And then you have the Alcorn defense, who has had an interception in all but two games. And those trends continue. Harold Blood is likely to throw a pick. Alcorn is likely to get a pick. Matter of fact, they got three of them joints. Matter of fact, they were able to return one for a touchdown. Matter of fact, they also returned a fumble for a touchdown. And that was all by Keenan Leachman. So, or Leachman. Yeah, Leachman, excuse me. He had himself a monster game. How you get a pick six and a fumble six? That was phenomenal, right? But that's what won this game. The, the all-corn defense suffocated the passing game. And we knew that coming in. It was one of those things where Harold Blood had some really good yardage performances along the way of this season. But at no point did he really make me feel comfortable. At no point did he really make me feel confident that he was going to be able to sling the rock, especially when you're going against some of the better teams in the conference. And when he got to somebody who is the number two ranked passing defense in the SWAC, he didn't look good. The, the Alcorn defense kept that Southern passing game from being able to do a single thing. And I'm only emphasizing passing game because they couldn't run either. But right now we're focusing on a secondary three interceptions, right? So let's, let's get into the 21 points. And that's why I wanted to highlight the 21. Let's look at these three scoring drives. Oh, sorry. First off, Alcorn had two touchdowns of their own, which made 14 points as compared to Southern's 21 as a team. I just want to put that out there right there to show you just how dominant and how, how, because dominant is a word when you talk about not being able to do anything, but they were playmakers in their own right, right? I thought that Alcorn was playmakers in the secondary, playmakers along the defense in their own right. They weren't just stopping plays. They were making plays. Now you look at the 21 points, the three scoring drives that that um that Southern had. First off, one was the first score of the game. And from that point, Alcorn scored 31 unanswered points. That right there tells you just how good that defense was. But let's get into the three scoring drives themselves. One muff punt, one off of a uh, of an interception. And then one, they actually drove 70 something yards. But the first two scoring drives that they had were both off of short fields. This was a offense like they tried lying to, to Southern fans on the broadcast, telling you that the game was close. Oh, we got a game now. It was still 17 points. We didn't have a game. It wasn't over, but we didn't have a game. Like after after Aaron Allen threw an interception, Southern scored a touchdown. They said, oh, we have a game. Then Alcorn drove down and got a field goal before halftime. And I was like, we don't have a game. Like, let's be realistic here. This is. We still have a ways to go before we start saying we have a game. and We never got to that place. Alcorn extended a lead very early, and they never let it close. So you got to give credit to that, and a lot of that credit goes to the Alcorn defense. But what was the impact of this game? Because a lot of times we look at the 60 minutes worth of action, and we can evaluate teams, but we're at a point where it doesn't matter just one game. It doesn't matter just about one game. It's about – what about PV? What about Alcorn? What about Grambling? What about Southern? What about the SWAC West? Where do those four teams fall in the division? We'll look at that as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by Athletic Brewing. And listen, the same way that Keenan Leachman changed the game, you could say the same thing about athletic brewing and how they've changed the game for non-alcoholic beers. Now, for me, the reason I love these so much is because you can drink them at any time. See, you drink an alcoholic beer, you got to watch, you might need to be in your house, you got to think about drop. You could drink these at your kids' soccer games, you could drink these um, while you're out on the town. There is no hangover, there's no effect, like you are perfectly fine. You don't have to drive or you should, you're not impaired while driving, you're safe but they also taste good. Nobody wants to just be, oh, safety. We also want good taste, right? We also want good taste because if that wasn't the case, I'd just go drink some juice. So go ahead and get you some non-alcoholic brews from athleticbrewing.com. And when you use the code Locked On College, you can get 20% off your first purchase. So go to athleticbrewing.com slash locked on, or excuse me, use the code Locked On, and you'll be able to get $20 off your first purchase. 
As we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day. And remember, on Friday, we'll have our college football kickoff live, which will be the biggest storylines around the college football landscape in the nation. So make sure you check it out so you can be a more informed college football fan. But right now, we kind of have our SWAC West. It's all culminating. In the next couple of weeks, we'll know who's going to face FAMU. But I feel like as long as the division is up for grabs, we should continue to come back and look at how somebody can grab the division. So let's start off with Alcorn. And I'll do the same thing next week if it's still up for grabs. But let's start off with Alcorn. They have the easiest route because they control their own destiny. They win the next two games. They're in. doesn't matter what anybody does. I don't care what PV does. don't care what Grambling does. don't care what Southern does. If Alcorn wins the next two games, they're in. Matter of fact, to add an extra layer to make it a little bit more than just one sentence, if Alcorn wins this week and PV would lose this next week, excuse me, or if Alcorn, because I'm still thinking about last week, if Alcorn wins this week versus Texas Southern, so their next game, and then PV loses this week against Southern, their next game, then Alcorn will be in the SWAC East, and it doesn't matter what happens against Jackson State. I'll say that one more time just because I'm not sure if I said TSU and Southern, so I'll use the, the, the letters to be clear. Alcorn plays TSU this week. If they win and PV loses to Southern this week, Alcorn is in the SWAC championship game. Simple and plain. So now let's get into Grambling because they're the other way. Matter of fact, I'm not even sure if Grambling is still in the race because I don't know how the four-way tie works. If somebody can break it down, let me know. But once you get there, it, it's too many tiebreakers that it goes through. And I just, I don't want to risk saying the wrong thing. So I'm going to operate under the idea because I do know they can tie. You can get a four-way tie and Grambling can be a part of that. But let's operate with that idea, right? So what they need, what they need is they need to win out first and foremost. And they're going to need a lot of help. If Grambling wants to win the SWAC, if they even still can win the SWAC with the four-way tie rules, they are going to need to win out, Alcorn is going to need to lose out, and you're still going to need a little bit of help around that. Because I looked at this Alabama State game that they just came off of, and I said it was a must-win. And I guess that might have been a little bit twisted, right? I might have twisted that up a little bit. But the reason it was a must-win in my eyes is because you didn't want to be here. And now you're literally in a must-win. Yes, technically, you lost against Alabama State and might still be able to do some stuff. But now you're at a point where you need so much help because you lost that game, because now you have three SWAC losses. So like I said, that was a must-win game. And now if you lose any game, you're done. You lose Friday to UAPB, you're done. You lose to Southern in the Bayou Classic, you're done. Alcorn wins next week, you're done. Like, it's that simple. It's that Southern versus PV, that's a different story because one of them has to lose after drop down to three games. But if you lose any game or Alcorn wins any game, you are finito, right? Now let's get into Southern because they're fun. Southern's the fun one because they really jacked themselves up here because now you're one game behind Alcorn. However, you also have no tiebreaker against Alcorn. So you need Alcorn to lose out, and you need to win out. In a four-way tie, I know I couldn't get everything, but in a four-way tie, they're the first ones out. If you lose to PV, you're done. Wrap it up. You lose to PV, it's over for you. Because the best thing that can happen if they lose to PV, this is a three-way tie between Alcorn, Prairie View, and Southern. So when I say that, in order for Southern to win the SWAC West, they have to win both of their final two games, and they need Alcorn to lose both of their final two games. However, if they lose to PV, you could still end in a three-way tie, but you would be the first team out because you lost to PV and you lost to Alcorn. If you get into a four-way tie, it gets into like some sort of divisional record where even if you beat PV, you would still be out because of the amount of losses you have within the SWAC West. Every other team has only lost one game in the SWAC West. Every other team. You would have now lost 
two games in the SWAC West. So that's where you kind of get jacked up because you lost the fam you, but that didn't count towards the division. That counts towards the conference. But if you look at a loss to um who they just lose to to Alcorn, and then maybe another loss to Grambling or PV, that's two divisional losses. Alcorn would not have that. Alcorn won't have that. PV won't have that. Right. So you kind of just in a in a dead end spot. But then you look at PV. For PV, you just got to beat Southern. You got to be Southern. You need Alcorn to lose one game, and you need to win out, and you're good. If Alcorn loses to TSU and you win out, PV wins. If Alcorn loses to Jackson State and PV wins out, you're in. And then we would have PV in the SWAC championship game for the second time in three years. And I'm not – look, I've said this before. I think Alcorn is the best team. I do. And when I was ranking potential opponents, the only reason they weren't higher is simply because I just think FAMU is the best team. But of this four, of the West Division, I think that Southern, or excuse me, I think that Alcorn is the best of the four. And I think they showed that against Southern. They had a very tight loss to Prairie View, and they beat Grambling. This, to me, is the best of the four. And if you go to point differential between all of these matchups, Alcorn has the best one. So as we move forward, I want to look at these keys to victory. Because we had keys to victory that we laid out last week. And... Both of them ended up being extremely influential, and I think it really told the story of why the gap, the final score gap, was the way that it was. So let's look back at those as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. And if you are a small business owner who is not using LinkedIn Jobs, that's shame on you. And if if you're an employee of a small business, go to your small business owner. And say, are you using LinkedIn? Because you know we got a void here. You know that Sherry just left. You know that you know that he just left. So let's go ahead and let's get somebody to fill in their position. Let's go to LinkedIn and find the qualification. Let's go to LinkedIn and find the person who's going to be the right fit for the team. Where you can get to kind of see who this person is. And not only just see what a piece of paper looks like. That's the biggest difference between LinkedIn and just seeing somebody. Let's get this done fast. And let's this get let's get this done for free. So quick and fast. Or excuse me, quick and fast. Quick and free. What more do you need? Go to LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Use the purple hashtag hiring frame and you can post your job for free. No charge at all. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day, every day, making it all the way to segment three. And I thank you two times for that. I want to look at how the keys to victory impacted this game on Saturday. So for me, I, I know that we came in and we say three matches of two storylines will key to victory. And yes, every single time I think that I'm going to be right. Like I don't just come up here and spew BS towards you. I always think that my keys to victory are going to be impactful. But when you have a game that was this far, right? Like this was 44 to 21. And even then it doesn't feel like it was that close of a game. You got to look at how we got there. And the key to victory for Alcorn was to protect their front line. The key to victory for Southern was to establish the run. And when I say the front line, I only mean the offensive line. Like I'm not saying that, the whole trenches. I'm saying the Alcorn offensive line versus the Southern defensive line was a battle that Alcorn needed to win. And I thought they did. And I thought it was the, I thought it showed in how they were able to run the ball. Jarvie and Howard is going on a nice stretch right now. He's picking up steam at the right time. Like you see how he's improving. You see the numbers that he's getting. I think this is his, I think he had two, a hundred yard games in the last three weeks, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think he had one last week, but I think he had one the, the week before. So you're seeing somebody pick up steam. You're seeing the way he runs. You're seeing the elusiveness. He's a big guy, but he's pretty elusive. You see his ability to slide off of tacklers. And you say, that's the Jarvion Howard who won newcomer of the year last year. That's the Jarvion Howard that I'm sitting here and saying could be the best running back in the conference at the beginning of the year. The guy that I'm saying could be a swag offensive player of the year candidate coming into the year and you see it you see and he's not making a bunch of contact behind the line of scrimmage 
He's getting through the hole before he's being touched. That's a sign of the line of scrimmage. Or excuse me, that's the sign of the offensive line. That's a sign of winning the front line. But then also that, you look at Aaron Allen. And Aaron Allen had himself a day. Aaron Allen came in and he had over 250 yards. And this is a kind of a repeated thing. Yes, you've seen against UA uh, PB versus Mississippi Valley State. Like, okay, they, were, they weren't 200. You see against Grambling, he had over 300. You had over 300 against PV as well. So in this game, it almost feels like you slipping. In this game, it almost feels like, dang, you couldn't hit 300 against one of your big Swack West guys? Right, that's the kind of standard that he has set, but he's played so well. Ain't that crazy? Ain't that crazy when you play so well that sometimes a really good game feels like below your standards? But that's how well that Aaron Allen has played in these type of games. But you're also not called on to do that much. He was called on to do everything, or he did everything he was called on to do. I thought he had a really good game. And you see it in his efficiency. You see it in his passing yards, right? So when you protect him, that happens. Less than five, ta five tackles for a loss. Only one sack, right? This was a good game by that front line, and it needed to be. So then you look at the next part, and that's Southern. Could you establish the run? No. No. And part of that is situational. Part of that is you are so far down that you're not able to run the ball. But I would argue that it was only the case in the fourth quarter, or at least it was at its worst in the fourth quarter, where you only had two rushing attempts. You didn't run the ball well before that. You didn't run the ball well in the first half, in the first quarter, where you had negative yards on the ground in the first 15 minutes of action. So even when it wasn't the situation, you just didn't do it well. And the reason this was so important is because let's call back to our first segment today. This was a huge mismatch. I knew that Southern wasn't going to be able to pass on them. And I think in the back of their mind, Southern probably knew they weren't going to be able to pass on them. But once you're down 20, 30 points, well, now you kind of got to start passing the ball. Now you have to start abandoning the run to a certain degree. Kendrick Grimes didn't have a good day. He didn't. They were able to slow him down. They brought him back down from his 100-yard games that he's had back-to-back. So once you can't throw the, or excuse me, once you can't run the ball, whether that's because of the situation or because you're just not doing it well, now you have to throw it. And when you have to throw it, you have Harold Blood going against one of the most opportunistic defenses in this conference. The second place team when it came to interceptions. Somebody who gets interceptions on a religious basis. Every single Saturday, you have stepped into their temple and they're going to show you exactly what they do. And that is pick off the ball. Like, this is, this is a situation where Aaron Allen did his thing. This is a situa situation where the Alcorn defense, the secondary, they did what they do. And it all came down to our keys to victory. Protect Aaron Allen, really protect the front line. But we're looking at Aaron Allen, only one sack allowed. You're looking at established run for Southern. They could not do it. And now you push them into what they were not going to be able to do well. That matchup did not favor them. It was the biggest advantage that Alcorn had. And because they got up early, because they were able to stop the run, Southern had really no choice other than to fall into that trap that Alcorn had. This is a big time game, guys. And I think the SWAT could be wrapped up next week. But it'll be really interesting if we go into the 19th and to, I don't think we go into the Bayou Classic with this being on the line. But actually, we wouldn't. We can't. We, we more than likely would not. So it'll be very interesting to see when we wrap up the SWAT. But no matter what, you know that I'll be here to discuss when it is wrapped up. So I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day. We'll be back with some MEAC talk yesterday or tomorrow, such as Howard and how they've been playing close all year and it finally bought a bit them in the butt. So we're going to look into that game, Southern or South Carolina State versus Howard on tomorrow's episode. But in the meantime, in between time, until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care. Stay blessed. Peace.